Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Oh, that's great. You want to turn him down just a touch? It's going to be tough to do that. So we're going to, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about your background, and then we're going to sort of let you loose to give a, a branding lesson. Cool. So this is, uh, you know, this is sort of like inside the actor studio for entrepreneurs. And uh, we like to sort of cover a little bit of your life behind the scenes. Um, and we would love to give, you know, have you give your framework, your philosophies along the way. I, I've watched you. You're not bashful, so that's going to come out. Um, no, but it, it, we're trying to give them tools and frameworks, not just to live an entrepreneurial life, to make a great life. So that's that. So can we start out at the beginning? Where were you born and where'd you grow up? Um, I was born in, uh, so I'll come to you in a second, by the way. <laughs> I feel very mercenary following Adam. Adam's a friend of mine, by the way. He's such a benevolent cause, and I'm kind of shilling products. <laughs> but um, we'll come to this in the end. But if you choose Gambia as your school or as your country, then I'm in on your, yeah. on your game. At least for five grand. <laughs> You negotiate a lot, but you start at five that's if you do that. That's your course. Beautiful country. Because? <laughs> well, so I'm a, I'm a third generation African, originally Indian, but my great grandfather moved to Africa 110 years ago. My grandmother's born there, my dad was born there, and I was born there. So that's what I would see as home where I grew up. What city in, in Zambia? Uh, Lusaka. Livingston and Lusaka, both. Beautiful, beautiful area. We've all jumped off, you know, the, the, the bungee at uh, Victoria Falls. Victoria Falls. And depending on which side. Did you catch the croc at the bottom? Or <laughs> no. no, that wasn't my thing. So at uh, what age were you there? Um, I was there probably, well, I went to boarding school in England. So on and off till I graduated. I would go back several times a year, three times a year, until I graduated, and then I would just go back once a year. So I go back still once a year now. And how big of a family, brothers and sisters? One sister in Chicago. You younger or older? I'm older. Okay. And um, what did your parents do for work? Um, entrepreneurial family. So my grandfather jumped on a ship leaving India like, I don't know, 70 years ago something, rolled down to the east coast of Africa and was, used to be a laborer and ended up building a, a hardware business. My dad took that over, made it a sort of farming, agricultural business, and they've been entrepreneurs their whole time. Just not something that I was passionate about, but it's an entrepreneurial household. Any your, like, early childhood aspirations or things that uh, you thought of doing when you were a kid? You know, I've, I've always liked brands. I've always liked uh, products, things you can feel. I, I never quite understood banking. Um, I always have arguments with my banking hedge fund guys. I'm not sure what the hell they do, actually. Um, uh, and they just sort of create instruments and products, but really there's nothing there. So I, I, like, I like stuff that's, that's physical. And, and just growing up, uh, one of the brands that I was fascinated with was Coke. I thought it was, it was a ubiquitous product, but had a lot of cachet. Everyone had an emotional connection with the brand. And it's probably the most iconic brand worldwide. So it's, it's always, the, the company has been great to me and it's always been a central part of my life pretty much, for my working life at least. That's a, it is so bizarre that something you admired as a kid in Zambia turns out to be a yeah. place to work, watch your company, I mean that's... Fired me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to give him that surprise quite yet, but we'll, we'll get there. So um, at what age do you leave, uh, you said you went to boarding school, what age? Uh, I was eight, I think, yeah. I cried in my cereal and stuff, like it was, but the schools weren't as good. And so at some point when I, my parents moved from this, you know, to the bigger town, there was, the, when we were in the smaller town, there were no great schools. So they felt they had to send me at an early age to get a great education. And where'd they send you? Uh, some snobbish boarding school in London. In Lo at eight years old? Eight. Eight years old? That's... I had to wear like a tie and a blazer and everything. That is, I mean, that like, is. It was like Hogwarts, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of what Hogwarts is based on. So how does that, um, how does that sort of mar mark your life, do you think? As sort of leaving home at eight years old, did you learn It makes you very independent, yeah, completely. You've got a, look, there's a community for sure. In boarding school, you have, a, but you have to have your independence, right? There's an, and it's sort of, you, you fend for yourself, but you also get a little bit of understanding of, of order. Uh, there's no way you can go home and whine to your parents. It's actually easier for my parents because during my bratty period, I'm not there the whole time, so the school keeps you in line, and then you try and do it over the summers, but they get a limited amount of brattiness. Right? <laughs> so for them, it was pretty good. So home uh, to Zambia during the summers, back oh, to school. Three times a year. Like three three, times yeah. Okay. And um, uh, I went to uh, you know, upper school or you know, secondary school there as well? Yeah. All right. Um, where'd you go to college? A uh, place called Nottingham. Not the only thing you guys would know is there was like a forest there and there was a couple of movies made, but that's about it, yeah. And Kevin Costner. <laughs> and what did you study? 
I, I was actually telling some guys who directed me here, because I have a bad sense of direction, I had no idea how to get them structured right here. Um, but I, I did engineering, and I was a terrible engineer. And, and, but I, you know, like Indian families, there's an Indian where like parents like to do like engineering, medicine, some shit that's really gonna pay out for the rest of your life. <laughs> but you know, marketing is not on that category of things that pay out. <laughs> so I did that and, and I was terrible and I called my dad a couple of times and I hate this, I, I, I may have to flunk out and I'm gonna come back home. Uh, I barely passed um, and then I realized that I should do something different. And so uh, coming out of, out of, uh, out of school, where do you say you want to go work and what do you want to do? Well, I, I like consumer goods, you know, and that was, I was, you know, Coke. And I, so I applied, if you applied to Coke, I applied to Unilever, you know, Mars M&Ms, and Mars M&Ms accepted me. So I'm like, soda, candy, it all sounds good when you're 20, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I was like, you know, as my girlfriend likes to remind me, I was like uh, inside, the, inside the chocolate machine, like I had to clean it out <laughs> and eat it and all sorts of stuff. So it's like 100 pounds heavier. But um, <laughs> I've been spinning since. But... Um, <laughs> But so I went, I went to work for Mars M&M's. But I did it in manufacturing because that, my engineering was my background. So I was kind of stuck with my undergrad then, you know, so I had to go from there from manufacturing into marketing. So that was my transition. But it's sort of a great background for a marketer to actually have built something and see how things are made. It, now I like it. Now when I sit, um, one of the, my team members who works with me and, and, and we go through stuff, I have a much better understanding of how my products are made and cost of goods and gross margins. It came from the manufacturing side. So I didn't like it then, but I find it useful now. And uh, how long did you stay uh, sort of on the manufacturing side of, uh, of, of Mars? Uh, I was there for three, four years. I was in this accelerated development program. So they bring you in, you're supposed to be like really smart, like pick the best in the country, fast track you. And then if you're good, you stay. If you're bad, they fire you. And you were working on which brand? Snickers. And then uh, I tried to get on Twix, but there was no. It was oh, like the, the Twix. biscuits are great. But it was mainly Snickers. And what do you guys call it? You call it Bounty. What do you call it here? Almond, almond Joy. That's almond it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different names in, uh, in Europe for Almond Joy, huh? Yeah. Um, and you were there how long? About three to four years, yeah. And then what? Then they fired me. Come on. <laughs> Rising well, star, what happened? Because uh, I, I was very young, first of all. 20, you don't on your head from your ass. And, and, and I was running like the second largest production line in Europe. I was managing like 30 people. Um, and then I got into the marketing operations department. And uh, I don't know, I, maybe I wasn't ready, but the, the guy, he was a really nice guy. He wasn't a jackass. Or but he said, look, right, I don't think you're, you're marketing material and you don't have the leadership skills for, for what we're looking for. So the program I was in was like an up or out program. And since I wasn't going up, I went out. So I went back to Zambia, bitched to my dad again. This is what happened. I was an engineer. Now this is bad. So I, he, he gave me some make work for like six months just uh, till I calmed down. And then I applied to business school. <laughs> That's the, the soft landing. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. I went to more school. I went to more school. Yeah. And uh, uh, went to a great business school. With, uh, I went to Michigan. And good experience there? Yeah, great. Tell us about that. Other than the weather, I mean, yeah. you know, in hindsight, maybe better, better to come here. But um, Michigan was fantastic. What it did was it sort of allowed me to transition to the world I wanted to go to. And the business school is not necessary, but if you do it, there's got to be a game plan to why you do it, right? So it's, for me, it was a change of gear. Like, I was in manufacturing. I wanted to get into marketing and branding. Uh, so I, did, I focused on strategy and, and, and marketing at, at Michigan, and it let me bridge to, to Coke, which is where I wanted to go. So shift in your career, you moved to the States, yeah. which is also not an insignificant thing either. Um, and your first job uh, after your MBA is? I uh, was ended up being associate brand manager on Sprite. On Sprite. So w how long ago is that? This was, I don't uh, mean to date you, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm older than I look. Uh, this was 15 years ago, probably. And 16 years ago. And some of the campaigns you ran for Sprite, I mean, remind us of that. These guys are 18 to 22 No years chance. Old. But There's just no going to with the campaigns. Which yeah. the, the Sprite, the, back in the day when I signed a young um, high school basketball player, just came out of high school. No, before no. that. Yeah. You see, this guy said LeBron James, but I mean. It was Kobe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Kobe Bryant, a guy who came out of uh, Wake Forest, who was a first round draft pick. Timber. Timmy Duncan. And uh, when she was hot, Missy Elliott, and we did a, we did a, we did a, we did a cool, we did a cool spot with them. And then we did a campaign. Um, I don't know if you know her, but it was there was a 
thing called Voltron. It's like, it's like the evil um, uh, Transformer and that the five lions come together to defeat Voltron. So the whole premise of the campaign was hip hop survives and it was a bigger metaphor, frankly, for within the African-American community. If you unite as a group, you survive stronger than if you try and fight independently. So we got hip hop artists from across the country, um, Goody Mob and got, you know, uh, people from the East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, and brought them together and in one creative campaign. And it was, for me, it was a kind of an education lesson at the same time as something that I built because it was never, wasn't my idea. It was a guy called Reginald Jolly. He was like a brilliant creative head, but it resonated because people understood it. But, you know, a lot of the kids who saw that campaign who are now in their mid-20s saw that when they came back from school and the parents weren't home and that's what they'd watch on TV. And so when you put that back into the community and in a way that was creative, the brand blew up. Yeah, it's so funny because, you know, within their lifetimes, Bright has been such a big name. You know, it's sort of on the shelf, everyone expects, but, but Bright wasn't always that exciting. No, not so exciting. So give us an idea of the growth uh, during... You know, so once we became a part, it was the NBA and hip hop were the two, two core cornerstones of what Bright sort of uh, built itself from. Uh, and because it was a lot of the, the cool kids who were like, that was what it was, even more so than today. I mean, today you can argue, dance music and you go to Vegas now and the D, you know electronic DJs are bigger than anything else out there but go back 15 16 years ago it was a lot more hip hop so Sprite basically went from this slow sort of slightly cheesy brand to a much more edgy cool irreverent brand and exploded probably from flat to 10% 12% growth which on a brand of Sprite scale was was big That's enormous yeah and uh, how long did you work with the Sprite brand? About three years. And what was your, what your reward for doing such a good job with Sprite? Um, <laughs> well, this is the other thing. So uh, I was going to do this is the first dot-com era, right? So not the social media, but the original bust. So I was about to leave uh, Coke because everyone was leaving to go to cool stuff. And I was like, I'm going to miss out on this. So I almost went to some travel dot-com, but not a good travel, not like Expedia where it was like a travel and then ended up going bust. Uh, they didn't give me the job I wanted, and then Coke uh, ended up actually giving me Powerade. So I got a cool brand that was declining, but I don't mind. As long as it's going down quickly or up quickly, I don't mind. Uh, I just don't like the steady brands. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so you said sort of, so Powerade is declining. Yeah. Um, what did you do to turn it around? Stop being a Me Too. Like, the problem with Powerade was they looked at what Gatorade had and they'd pick up the, the leftovers. Like, oh, Gatorade has the NFL and the NBA, we'll take the NHL. Well, who gives a shit about the NHL? Like, <laughs> like if you're 10 miles south of the Canadian border, it's all good. But after that, it doesn't matter. And yeah, I'm sure there's some Ducks fans here. But, but generally, you know, that's... So they, were just, they, they weren't picking stuff that was relevant. So I said, look, if, if we can't get the leagues, they'll go after the athletes. So that's when the LeBron James comes in or the Andy Roddick and before the dogs, Michael Vick. And, you know, <laughs> I, he was a good dude before, but I mean, his, his homies screwed him up. But I mean, it was definitely a, he was, uh, yeah. So, but he was the hottest athlete coming out of the, in the sport at the time. So we went after premier athletes and then we did a lot with the action sports community. So Gatorade hadn't gone there. They were sticking very much to the core. So we went into the action sports community. New packaging. And we got people to believe. One of my themes when I finally stop jabbering and speak is belief in yourself and belief in your product. And I had to instill belief back into the bottlers and then the retailers and then consumers. Because if the bottlers don't put it on the sh uh, to retailers, retailers don't put it on the shelf, then no one else is buying it. So there's three stages of belief that I had to put into the brand. And uh, so you turned it around. And so what, what type of growth did Powerade see after that? We went from like flat to declining growth to 20, 30% growth. And so we went from, we were pretty much going to be gone. Once you're in a single share territory, we were like a nine share, you're heading south, it's game over. And we then came back and brought it to about 20% share. And I think power rate is now 25 or 28, close to 30% share. So it's, it's, a, it's a genuine pain in the ass for Gator right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just the me too. Th you yeah, know. it's no longer me too. It seems odd that, you know, th there's a lot of that sort of me too, let's just be number two. Um, in different industries, particularly entertainment, you know, it's just like, we, we have a Britney Spears, we gotta go find a Britney Spears. And, but you wouldn't think like a, a Coke would do that, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like a good strategy for such a market leader to just... They're very good at being leaders. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sometimes when you're very good at being a leader, you're not sure how to be a challenger. That's very good. Read that Write it down. <laughs> they already did. Okay. That is really good, that's true. Um,
So you have this great growth in Powerade. You turn the brand around. Um, you're, you know, starting to get a lot of press and notoriety. You're on the cover of Brand Week. You know, hot young executive on the way up. Um, what is sort of the, the internal happenings at Coke and relationship with your boss? How's that going? <laughs> I got to thank my boss because if she hadn't fired me, then I wouldn't have done well. So um, again, I was very young in this role. So part of it was I was getting a lot of accolades. I was written up in a lot of magazines. And my previous boss was fantastic. She sort of realized that I had a decent amount of potential. And so she, she gave me a wide berth, but she kept me like, you know, the bowling alley? <laughs> like you put those big like um, the chain, bumper balls, the bumper balls, right? So she put some wide bumpers. So I had a lot of room to move. And but when I hit the bump, I knew I had to come back in. Uh, and, and then she got moved elsewhere and they brought someone else in and she, I scared her a little bit. And so, and she was a little, she was nice, but she, she you know, she, she, whatever. So, um, <laughs> so she brought the bumpers in really close. And so I, I couldn't really move. And, and finally I just bumped out of the bumpers into other lanes and that caused a lot of friction. And so even though when I was written up in a lot of magazines and stuff, she put me on a performance improvement plan. You know what that is? This means you're going to get fired if you get put on those things. It's technically supposed to mean that they really want you to improve your performance. But by the time you get there, it's an HR mumbo jumbo for we're going to fire your ass. So you've got 30 days and this is, this is legitimized. Uh, so I saw that coming and I thought, you know what? The founders of, um, of a small beverage company, no one had ever heard of, frankly, called Vitamin Water, had called me. I love the product. I drank it. I didn't drink sodas. I didn't drink juices. Why am I hanging around in a job that I'm probably going to get canned from? So I, right before they could do that, I, I leapt. And uh, you, you just sort of mentioned that you like the product. When people are faced with these decisions on whether to you know, join the startup, what sort of filters do you use to, to evaluate the product and the opportunity? Why, did, why was that attractive to you? Yeah, I get this question a lot for my brands. And people are, because I'm, I'm involved, luckily, in a lot of companies. And uh, so people say, well, you know, how big is your team? It's always it's me and Stevie. And that's it. And then I get a lot of intellectual advice from my girlfriend, Sarah, because she was the brand director on Vitamin Water. So it's like, that's, that's the gang. And a lot of it is based to me on gut. Um, never underestimate your gut. Data is always available to everybody. All of you probably have the same textbooks and you read out of the same stuff. What makes it different is going with your gut. And when you go with your gut, that's the edge that not everyone else has. And for me, I only really get involved in products that I use. And, and I don't believe uh, that I'm the only person trying to be healthier or feel better about myself or trying to lose weight. So all the products I get involved in, I feel that other people must want this. You know, if they don't want a fried chip, pop chips, that gentleman has one over there, is you know, half the fat and tastes great. Why wouldn't I have that? Or if I don't want a lot of sodium, but I want potassium and I want a product that's natural versus man-made, I'll do a Vitacoco over a Gatorade. I mean, the war of man versus nature, you know, nature's undefeated. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> so you get to the point where you have enough information where your gut tells you what to do, and then you know, yeah. I you mean, know. I do research, but we go a lot off belief in the products and the gut that this is something that people are looking for, and then we help build it. And it was just uh, was didn't the CEO of, of sort of Smart Water find you through press? So yeah, he, he was. Didn't have a relationship, right? No, he was actually on the front cover of of, of Brand Week two years earlier. And so then they were looking for like a uh, you know, head of marketing and become a partner in the company. And so he was flicking through the issues like, oh, this guy looks okay. <laughs> and so he must have called a few others. They said no. So I'm like, all right, I'm available. Let's do this. That happens, that happens a lot too. Um, so tell us what you joined. What, what, what was the sort of size and breadth of the company when you joined? Um, Product. I think when I joined, we were doing well in New York, like the cool, the hipsters, the Lower East Side, you know, the Upper East sort of the you know, the, the high-end moms like the product. But across the country, there was, there, was, there was no buzz around the brand. We're probably doing about trailing 12, like, I don't know, 25, 30 odd million uh, when I joined. And um, so it was, a, it was a decent company, but nothing, nothing, didn't have the sizzle just yet outside of areas of New York. And so, you know, with a really great team that we put together, we decided to, to make this a national brand and make it part of people's lifestyles. And so that's what we did, did the whole buzz and, you know, took the brand and made it hot in New York and L.A. and San Francisco and Chicago and lit mini fires across the country that ultimately connected into an inferno. And it takes money to do that, doesn't it? Or did you just, were most of these, you know, to sign these big celebrities or are you are giving them sort of 
back end participation, you know, to, to sign the, the names of the people that you've done and to grow that way? Did you have like, a private equity firm behind you? Did you have just a bunch of money in the bank ready to go? Did you guys have to go out and raise it and sell this vision? So combination, um, the CEO, probably one of the, the best guys I've worked with in terms of painting. He's a Van Gogh when he paints a vision. Like, you know, I mean, got, he's the one who got Coke to pay four billion. I did the intro and he's the one who said the number starts with a four. That was his line. I would have said 400, no, he said no, four billion. I said, okay, sounds good. Um, so, and so in order to do that, he had to paint the vision. So he was very good at going to paint the vision. So we, we had sufficient funding, but it's less about the funding, it's more about the creativity because we didn't have enough money to do what we did. What we did was I hired people, and now I'm going into half my presentation, we should probably forget about it, but um, we hired people who believed in the brand and were brand messiahs. And so the brand messiahs really m turned the brand on. So instead of using $100,000 to turn on Philadelphia, the guy we called Slim Slacks because he had very tight pants. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, they used to wear girls' jeans, he's that skinny. Um, Slim Slacks, you would do it like with 30 grand or 20 grand. So he'd, you know, he'd use it for a quarter of what would happen because he was part of that community. He was part of what was happening in Philly. So he helped make the brand hop there with a lot smaller budget. And then things like 50 Cent became where we pioneered the equity deal. Every celebrity now wants skin in the game. Back in the day, it used to be cash. How much cash? Mm -hmm. Now it's, I don't care about cash, what's the skin?